I'm Richard Taylor from the Philosophy Department at Marquette University, and together with my colleague Andrea Robilio at the Catholic at the Catholic University of Leuven, uh, where we are both members of the De Wolf Monsignon Center for Ancient Medieval and Renaissance Philosophy, uh, we present to you then this course on Thomas Aquinas. This is Lecture 5b, 5a concerned proofs of God and method in Aquinas, and 5b is going to cover some of the structure, some remarks on the structure of the Summa Theologiae and also briefly arguments for the existence of God, the famous five ways in Summa Theologiae Prima Pars, question two. So let's begin. Before we turn to our brief consideration of the famous five ways then of Aquinas, I want to take a few minutes to look at the Summa Theologiae and its structure. Aquinas began this work in 1268. The work is divided into three major parts, but it's unfinished in its third part. The parts and subdivisions are as follows. The first part consists of 119 questions. The treatise on God, which we're focused on the last class and this class, uh, con concerns first uh, the first question, the issue of sacred doctrine, its nature, uh, and human understanding. Uh, and, and then uh, 2 through 26 concern God as can be naturally known by human beings, and 27 to 43 concerns Trinity and divine persons purely theological account. Uh, that continues then, questions 44 to 49, I have a, I consist of a treatise on the nature of creation. The treatise on angels, the highest of created entities, is in questions 50 to 64. The treatise on the work of the six days, that is the origination of the natural world that we see around us, is in questions 65 to 74. Treatise on human beings, question 75 to 102. And then finally, Treatise on Divine Government or Providence. The first part of the second part has 119 questions. The prologue has 114, pardon me, questions. And the prologue has questions 1 through 48. And this concerns such things as the end of human existence, uh, happiness for human beings, the nature of divine will, and many related things. The treatise on habits is closely related to Aristotle's discussion of virtues and discusses virtues, both natural and supernatural virtues. Very interesting account. And then the treatise on law, which deals with, among other things, natural law. The second part of the second part consists of 189 questions on important topics such as prudence and justice, fortitude and temperance, and, as he puts it, acts which pertain especially to certain men or human beings. The third part, the third part uh, consists of uh, questions 1 to 90. This work is incomplete, and it concerns, the, uh, concerns Christ and the Incarnation. Our concern here uh, is with the first part of the uh, work, the Prima Pars, since we're studying metaphysics in Aquinas, insofar as it is a science to be attained by natural human reason as an object of philosophical study, though, of course, we're not going to be disregarding the fact that Aquinas was first and foremost a theologian, and that we are drawing on his theological writings and also his philosophical teachings. Uh, but that said, I do want to point out to you that there's much of important philosophical material in this second part. For example, in the first part of the second part, Aquinas begins with the consideration of ultimate human happiness, as I mentioned, something quite relevant for its metaphysical teaching about the goal of human existence and its attainment. Will, passions, love, pleasure, and much more can be found there. That's then followed by a second treatise on habits, as I mentioned, which considers human psychology of habit and its metaphysical foundation, including moral and intellectual virtues. The treatise on law is also insightful and uh, provides an interesting discussion of grace in questions 109 to 114. I know in some of our discussions online, the issue of grace has surfaced, and this might be a valuable uh, few questions to have a close look at if you're interested in the topic of grace. But I'll leave that to you to look at the structure of that and the rest of the work. And now let's focus on the prima pars. Now, while this particular core, in this particular course, we can't focus uh, a great deal of time on this, uh, this whole work, and even on this, this part, uh, though it is a brilliant intellectual creation uh, on Aquinas' part, 
I do want to suggest to you that Aquinas put a very great deal of thought and care into its construction. He has a very, very analytical mind, uh, and he's very, very insightful, and he has a very good understanding of exactly where he's going, what he wants to establish. This is a very mature work, uh, and uh, certainly with regard to human psychology and many other things, Aquinas, to his mind, has sorted these matters out, and now he's in a position to create a new work, a summa of theology, that's suitable for beginners in theology. So it's, a going, it, it's important to be very well structured for Aquinas for pedagogical reasons. And we're fortunate that, in fact, the clarity of his argument can be seen in many ways. Uh, there are arguments about the nature of human intellect and the ends of human action, which are uh, complexly grounded in, inten uh, in an intentional thread of thought that extends through many of the questions and articles right back to arguments set out in the beginning of the entire treatise, entire work. Uh, that is to say, its structure is extremely well crafted with reason and argumentative grounding. The same thoughtful structure is found in other treatises as well, of course. As I, as I mentioned, question 44 is on the procession of creatures from God and uh, on the, uh, the first cause of all things. It's also on the mode of emanation of things from the first principle. And question 46, of the beginning of the duration of creatures. 47, the distinction of things in general. 48, the distinction of things in particular. And 49, the cause of evil. It's then followed, as I said, by consideration of the highest creatures, angels, in 14 questions. Uh, the famous treatise on man is an extraordinarily clear construction, rich in detail. And then finally, again, as I mentioned, and mentioned is the treatise on divine government uh, or creation. Uh, the government of creation. In sum, while we need not easily concede the arguments to Aquinas on many matters here, the Summa Theologiae is a marvel of what I would call rationalist or intellectualist theology at its best in the Middle Ages. It's certainly more intellectualist than other works of major works of theology that are found in the Middle Ages, I think. Uh, something which many others have already said, of course. Uh, but we are philosophers, so let's proceed toward our brief consideration of the arguments for God in Prima Par's question 2. Prima, Par, Prima Par's question 2 has three articles. Uh, the first article concerns utrum deum esse sit per se notum, that is, whether God's existence is something known through itself or self-evident. Uh, that's the translation of per se notum. Uh, and it's and is such that it is something immediately grasped by the mind as such. Uh, a question on method through consideration of what it means for something to be self-evident. So that's what this is concerned with. What does it mean for something to be self-evident? And is God, in fact, something that is self-evident to human beings? Is God immediately present to us in some way where we should obviously assert the existence, uh, the existence of God? The context, if one looks closely then, the context is clearly the discussion of science and knowledge in Aristotle's posterior analytics. If it turns out that God is not a per se notum for us, then of course the next question will be uh, whether demonstration applies to God. And then indeed if demonstration applies to God, then we, if the answer to that is yes, then we have the five ways. And of course, that's the structure Aquinas has lined up. But the value of the five ways as demonstrations needs to be established uh, earlier in the sense of establishing what demonstration is and establishing that, in fact, with demonstration, we're doing something different from uh, the assertion of God as a per se notum, as we find in, for example, St. Augustine, at least on the analysis of Aquinas. So for Aquinas, the issue concerns Anselm's famous argument regarding that than which nothing greater can be conceived. Uh, so this is a, a Anselm's notion that, in, in fact, we can immediately, when grasping that proposition, we can immediately understand that God exists in reality, or through a brief argument, we can understand that. But here for Aquinas, we have to note his opening remarks in his response. He says the following, there are two ways in which something can be known per se in one way, in its own right, secundum se, but not to us, quo ad nos. And uh, in the second way, both in its own right and to us, close quote. 
It's on the, on the basis of this that then Aquinas concludes the following. He says, I claim that the proposition, there is a God, is known per se as far as it itself is concerned. Notice what he's saying. Is, is it in any way the case that, that, uh, that there is a God, that that is known per se? And he asserts, yes, it is known. He continues then, since the predicate is the same as the subject. For, uh, as will become clear below, God is his own essay or existence. All right. But because we do not know the real definition of God, this proposition is not known per se to us. Okay, so we do not have per se knowledge of God as such. We may have in a confused way a notion of a higher principle of some kind, but we don't have a per se notion of God immediately present in us, according to Aquinas. Instead, says Aquinas, it has to be demonstrated by means of things that are more known to us and less known by their nature namely God's effects, close quote. And of course, what he means less known by nature, the things down here are less intelligible than higher things, and God is the most intelligible thing of all. But we must proceed on the basis of what is presented to us in sense perception. We don't have an immediate understanding of the very nature of God in a, in a sufficiently clear way. So the method to prove God has to be a posteriori as founded in effects of God available to us by natural human knowing. That is through the senses, internal sense powers, and natural human reasoning. So he establishes then how we can proceed. And it's not through any kind of per se notum or self-evident proposition, but rather on the basis of experience of the world. So the next question then, raises the issue again of the nature of demonstration. Here with the Supreme Empire's question two, Article two, here the scientific the Aristotelian scientific context becomes especially clear with the second article, Utrum Deum sit demonstrabile, uh, whether God is a sort of thing that can be demonstrated. If this can be established, then one can proceed to try to provide a careful proof of God, or perhaps five proofs of God. First, then, what is demonstration? We've already encountered this in Aristotle, but here, uh, in, in the previous lecture, uh, but here Aquinas writes the following, quote, there are two kinds of demonstration. One kind is through a cause and is called demonstration propter quid. And this sort of demonstration is through things that are prior, absolutely speaking. And the second kind is through an effect, and it is called demonstration quia. And this sort of demonstration is through things that are prior with respect to us. For since an effect is more apparent to us than its cause, we proceed through the effect to, the co to a cognition of the cause. So the propter quid demonstration would, acquire, would require us to understand the essence of God, whereas the quia demonstration does not require that we understand the essence, but it can point to the cause of something. Second, effects, that is, things of the world available to us through our natural powers of knowing, give evidence of their cause, and these are our starting points, says Aquinas. Quote, now from any effect it can be demonstrated that a cause proper to it exists, as long as its effects are more known to us. For since effects depend on a cause, it follows that once an effect is posited, it must be that its cause exists prior to it. Hence, insofar as it is not known to us per se, there is a God, this is demonstrable through effects that are known to us. So we must start with what's closer to us, but has less intellectual content, and we must rise up then to what is more distant from us, but has greater intellectual content, but is much harder for us, that is understanding things uh, that are higher and above us through uh, demonstration quia and not demonstration propter quid. This is also valuably spelled out by Aquinas in the reply to the second objection. There he writes the following. When a cause is being demonstrated through an effect, 
The effect has to be used in place of a real definition of the cause in order to prove that the cause exists. This is especially so in the case of God. For in order to prove that something exists, one must take a nominal definition, that is quid significat nomen, and not a real definition, quid est, as the middle term, since the question, what is it, is posterior to the question, is there such a thing? He then continues, but as will be shown below in question 13, article 1, the names of God are imposed on the basis of his effects. The names, of course, of God are the attributes of God. Hence, when we are demonstrating that there is a God on the basis of his effects, we can use a nominal definition of the name God as the middle term. Close quote. The result reached then is not a comprehensive knowledge of the nature or essence of the cause, God, but rather the affirmation that the cause exists. And of course, that's what the whole article is about, the question of uh, the whole issue here, the question of, of whether God exists. The elucidation of the nature or essence of God and God's attributes follows after the existence of God is established. But that elucidation is, is extremely weak because of the transcendence of the object, in this case, God. So now let's turn to uh, Summa Theologiae Prima Pars question to the third article on Deus Sit, whether God exists. Now, take note so far of the brevity of all of these arguments uh, we've seen so far, and especially the brevity of the arguments that are going to be coming going to be coming here as well. Is that a sign of how much they presuppose? Or is it perhaps a sign of how serious they're taken? It's difficult to say, but certainly the, the brevity of the argument has to be taken into account, probably in connection with the fact that, again, the work is a work for beginners. Of course, elsewhere, Aquinas works harder in the explanation of these accounts, such as is the case with the Summa Contra Gentiles, he devotes more discussion to the argument from motion. One should also consider his commentary on the physics of Aristotle, which we'll touch on a bit, uh, touch on briefly a bit later in this course. The first way then, motion, the argument that Aquinas calls manifestior, or more evident even to the senses. The sources for this are Aristotle's Physics, Averroes' Commentary on Aristotle's Physics, and the Guide for the Perplexed by Moses Maimonides, this last Opie uh, mention, uh, mentions in his article. This reasoning applied to metaphysical eminative causality is borrowed from Aristotle's Physics by the Neoplatonist philosopher Proclus for his, work in, uh, for his use in the work Elements of Theology. But Aquinas was not aware of this uh, aspect of the thought of Proclus. The argument proceeds on the basis of motion visible to the senses and reasons that motion must be caused by something outside the thing moving. That is, everything that is moved must be moved by another, of course taken straight from Aristotle. Aquinas then argues, quote, if then that by which something is moved is itself moved, then it too must be moved by another and that other by still another. But this does not go on to infinity. For if it did, then there would not be any first mover, and as a result, none of the others would affect movement either. He continues, for secondary movers effect movement only because they are being moved by a first mover, just as a stick does not affect movement except because it's being moved by a hand. Therefore, one has to arrive at some first mover that is not being moved by anything else, and this is what everyone takes to be God. Uh, this, uh, well, I already indicated that this is in fact used in Proclus's Elements of Theology, uh, borrowing it from Aristotle's Physics as well. Uh, but let's carry on. The second way, and I think this, this has uh, more viability than the first, uh, possibly. Uh, the second way is by way of efficient causality. Its sources, again, are Proclus, Avicenna, and the Liber de Causis. The argument is taken, clearly taken, directly from the metaphysics of Avicenna, which it itself was likely founded on 
Avicenna's reading of the accounts in the Liber de Causis, which in turn was based on reasoning in the elements of theology by the Greek Neoplatonic thinker Proclus. I should mention one scholar who's focused on uh, his uh, quite a bit of research on the importance of Proclus in the reasoning, reasoning of Aquinas is Wayne Hanke at Dalhousie. And I give you the URL there, uh, but you can Google that for yourselves and uh, see some of the work that Hanke has done on this. The argument here from Aquinas is just four sentences. Quote, but it is impossible to go on to infinity among efficient causes, for in every case of ordered efficient causes, the first is a cause of the intermediate, and the intermediate is a cause of the last, and this regardless of whether the intermediate is constituted by many causes or, just, or, or by just one, clearly taken out of Avicenna. He continues, but when a cause is removed, its effect is removed. Therefore, if there were no first among the efficient causes, then neither would there be a last or an intermediate. So it's an argument, in a sense, from a kind of primary causality here, uh, and to a primary and to a primary cause. But if the uh, efficient causes went on to infinity, there would not be a first efficient cause, and so there would not be a last effect, or any intermediate efficient causes either which is obviously false, given the world that we have around us. Therefore, we must posit some first efficient cause, which everyone calls God. And uh, the essence of this argument, or the, the core of this argument, is taken from Avicenna's metaphysics, as I said. And it has to do with the hierarchy of efficient causes. The third way concerns the necessary and the possible. And again, this is a source uh, for uh, Aquinas here is Avicenna, and also perhaps a bit of Aristotle who may have influenced Avicenna's thinking on this issue as well. As we'll see later, Avicenna begins the argument with the assertion of three primary notions, one being a necessary. But Aquinas does not prove, uh, not proceed in that way. Instead, Aquinas asserts that some things are able to exist and not to exist, referencing generation and corruption. And then he goes on to assert that not all things can be such as this, and so, quote, not all beings are able to exist and able not to exist. Rather, it must be that there is something necessary in the world. Otherwise, the world wouldn't be here. So if everything was possible of existence, then it would eventually go out of existence. That's the sort of thinking that he has in mind, taking it from Aristotle. Uh, he hasn't said here whether that, that what is necessary is one or many so far. And that's one of the lines of critique uh, for this argument. He then writes the following. Now, uh, every necessary being either has a cause of its necessity from outside itself, or it does not. But it's impossible to go on to infinity among necessary beings that have a cause of their necessity. In the same way as was proved above that it is impossible to go on in, to infinity among efficient causes. Therefore, one must posit something that is necessary per se, which does not have a cause of its necessity from outside itself, but is instead a cause of necessity for the other necessary things. But this everyone calls God. And this is clearly derivative upon, uh, upon Avicenna's account, but it modifies it somewhat. It's very, as he himself points out, though it's very similar to the argument from efficient causality, because the the uh, what 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 has to come about is the necessitating of things through a, a prior cause or a highest cause in this case God. The fourth way has to do with gradation in things. The sources are uh, Aristotle's Metaphysics, Book Two, Alpha Eliton, uh, and perhaps Averroes as well. Certainly Averroes would hold that there is something that is maximally being, and so good and so forth, but Averroes establishes that with a very different argumentation. Here Aquinas pretty much follows Aristotle, and Aquinas concludes his writing on this here, quote, but as is claimed in the same book, Aristotle's Metaphysics, that which is maximal in a given genus is a cause of all the things that belong to that genus. For instance, fire, which is maximally hot, is a cause of all hot things. 
Therefore, there is something that is a cause for all beings of their essay, their existence, their goodness, and each of their perfections, and this we call God. This sounds interesting, perhaps, but it seems to me to require first that there be a proof of God as being, maximally, and only then uh, can this reasoning uh, continue to explain hierarchy. But I don't care to dawdle over this argument. The fifth and the last of the five ways, then, is the argument from providential governance and finality. It's a common view of order in the universe and the attribution of that order or finality or purposefulness in the universe to God. But Aquinas derives it from Averroes as well as others. To some extent, the view comes from the account of providence in Alexander Aphrodisius' work on the cosmos, where he spells out in detail his own neo-Aristotelian account of providence and how all is ordered to God as to an end. That work is only extant in Arabic now, by the way. But none of the arguments, uh, of these five arguments, uh, as they stand, are sufficient as I view it. Uh, and as a number of the critics have viewed, viewed it as well, and you've seen it in some of the recommended literature, the difficulties of it. Perhaps the most viable is the second, but that and uh, that as well as the others require considerable filling out. And of course, from a modern perspective, much of this does not translate into science or philosophy in the 20th or 21st century. Uh, but that is my own view, and certainly there are others who hold views very different. So that does the last of our discussion, our arguments uh, on the existence of God here, although I'm sure the issue will come up again elsewhere uh, in our discussion of metaphysics and Aquinas. All right, thank you very much.